Good morning, good morning. I'm Susan Smith. Welcome to my studio, Stitched by Susan. I'm so glad you're tuning in this morning for today's freehand edge to edge quilting project. So I'm coming to you from the Inland Northwest, um, Washington State in the US. And we're a beautiful, beautiful sunny day this morning. So there's lots of light in the studio. I have a patio door set of windows and another big window. So my studio is well lit and cheerful in the mornings. I absolutely love it. So how are you all this morning? When you, wherever you're chiming in from, would you let us know? Especially if you are new to seeing these episodes, I'd love to, to know that if you're a new watcher and maybe where you saw or heard about me, that helps me out. Um, what else? Yeah, we've been online actually an awful lot this last week. Um, as I chat, Dave's going to throw up a couple pictures, I hope, of what we've been working on. Oh, it's going to be a minute or two till he gets that done. While he does that, I'll let you know. Um, in the studio is myself, obviously, quilting. My husband is behind the scenes, behind a bank of monitors and wires and smartphone cameras and stuff like that, keeping everything going. So it's just we two bringing you these live and unscripted episodes. So kind of the premise of these um, episodes is that long arm quilting can be a very solitary occupation, right? You're at home doing it by yourself. You don't get to see how someone else is doing it. You know, like when you're a baby learning how to walk, you see everybody else doing it, right? You get the balance and whatever. Well, long arming's not like that. It's harder to just absorb information by seeing someone else do it. So my hope is that these episodes will be helpful to you in that way because they're just me doing a perfectly ordinary quilt with an edge to edge design from start to finish. So I start right from loading and go all the way to the end and it's unscripted and unedited. So you get to see everything. You get to see the thread breaks, the oopses, whatever happens, you get to see it and you see it in real time. So you get some sense of how long things take and that sort of thing too. So I'm hoping that is really helpful, especially to newer long arm quilters that it just gives you confidence. This is how it's done. And I'm a talker, so I kind of talk through the decisions of the process as I'm going through them. And so I'll tell you why I'm doing things or why I'm not doing things. And that maybe will help you too to make those decisions in your own quilting processes. So have we got pictures yet, Dave? We've got two. I'm just working on that. Working on pictures. So basically, over the last week, we started last Monday, um, I was doing a custom quilt, a uh, pretty detailed custom quilt. So it had embroidered, hand embroidered blocks, um, and then some piecing and some simple appliqueing as well were on it. And because I spent a lot of time, I invested a lot of time in that embroidery, I decided I was going to invest some time in custom quilting too. It's not a thing I do super often, but it is fun from time to time to make a really kind of elaborate and fussy quilt. So we filmed all of that live and aired it as well because I thought that too would be helpful for you to see there's there's a lot of different processes that go into a custom quilt like larger backing or double batting or basting and anchoring things over the quilt so not every minute of the quilting was aired but every process so every border or every block I showed at least once and my thought processes again and how I came up with designs and the audition method that I use and talked about the thread and all those things so all those episodes are available on this Facebook page for replay and for rewatching all of this week still. And then Friday, we're going to retire them and repurpose it as a um, for purchase lecture. We're going to polish it a little bit, edit it down a little bit shorter. There must be, I don't know, Dave, 12 hours of raw video, something like that. It's huge. So a lot. But thank you to many of you who I know joined me then and are back today. And I especially appreciate the students of my Freehand Quilting Masterclass who've been massively supportive in these live episodes and interactive. And I love that. So have we got any people chiming in? We do, and let's do that next. Let's do that before the pictures. I have to take my glasses off to read the screen. Jenna, good morning. Jenna and I are getting to be good friends virtually. Melody, good morning, another frequent flyer. Donna, good morning from Pennsylvania. Mickey, good morning from North Georgia Mountains. Long way from us. Long way from us, yes. Hello from Delaware, also long way from us. Have enjoyed watching you this week, thank you. Anne from Bergen County, New Jersey. Annabelle, good morning from sunny Downers Grove, Illinois. I'm in your academy classes, fantastic. 
Annabelle, I think I said that incorrectly, I'm sorry. And Sam, hi from Grand Forks, BC. And I'm a Canadian girl, so I know where Grand Forks is. Patra from Harbor, Oregon. And Cheryl Ann, good morning. And Susan, good morning from Illinois. Well, you know, we're well represented across the U.S. this morning and Canada. Uh, Sam, backing was too small for today's quilt. Going to take off. Uh, that does happen. But at least you found it before, I trust, and not after. Debbie, hello from Plymouth, Michigan. Barbara from Chattanooga, Tennessee. Lots of these names are familiar. I'm so glad you came back. Jana, getting my first COVID vaccine this morning. Good for you. Susan, morning to you too. Thanks. Dave appreciates that, I know. Robin, good morning. I love your little profile pic, Robin. It's very apropos. <laughs> that's those, and, then we'll and that's it. So let's look oh, at a couple oh, oh. pick. Well, we can come back to to names, Dave. Uh, from Kamloops, BC, Rosemary, welcome. Okay, so a few photos are going to come up beside me. Am I on the right side? There we go. So I don't know if you saw this. I posted it on the Facebook page yesterday. My cat underneath. He is sort of always around my quilting room and I call him the quilt police because usually his nose is hanging right over stuff keeping an eye on it so that was him when the sundress quilt was still loaded here's the whole thing I haven't taken a really good photo shoot yet but this gives you an idea of the big picture so to speak it is about 65 inches square so it's not a huge quilt um, there's one little sundress with all the details another little sundress and this one really highlights, if you were watching me quilt, I kind of sketched in placement for the three little swoops and two or three spirals in every square so that I didn't forget to put them in and so that they were more or less evenly dispersed. You can really see it um, in this photograph. So that's what we were working on all the last week. So if you want to review any of those again, if you think you have a friend who would be interested, this is the week for sharing them. They're free and accessible all this week. Raw and uncut, mind you, but accessible all this week. So. Um, if also, if you have friends who you think might be interested in this more casual edge to edge work, um, I encourage you to share this post at any time this morning. Um, this one will always be available for replay and in a day or two, we'll also get it uploaded onto my YouTube channel. So if that's your preferred place to watch, great, you can find it there. So on YouTube, I would absolutely love if you would like and subscribe and click on the little bell, then you get notifications whenever new episodes are uploaded. Um, in terms of Facebook, I was scoping around in there this morning and I found that you can not so much leave reviews on my Facebook page as you can leave recommendations. And if any of you cared to do that, I would be really, really appreciative. It gives me a nice rating, a stars rating on Facebook based on your recommendations. I'd be so appreciative. And one last thing, in case you didn't see me say it yesterday, I will tell you again today. Whoop, whoop. I am published once again and this is in card is falling out. The McCall's Quilting Magazine that just came out onto shelves. It is the May-June 2021 issue. And yeah, got a quilt in there and it's called My Dear Watson. And I love Sherlock, so that was very apropos. Okay, let's get to quilting. Oh, Dave says more people saying good morning. Diane Taylor, good morning from East Wenatchee. Hi, Donna. Another Donna, good morning. Donna's are thick on the ground today. Melody, it's beautiful. I don't know if you meant this one or the sundress quilt, but either way, I'm happy. Oh, I'm sorry. I said Diane. I said Donna. You said Donna. Sorry about that. <laughs> Good morning, anyways. And Michelle. And Michelle. So beautiful. You deserve all those ribbons. You're a fantastic quilter. Thanks so much, Michelle. I appreciate it. I often say ribbons were never the goal. I don't quilt four shows, but it sure is a nice pat on the back to receive ribbons. That is the truth. Let's get to today's project. My mic is coming off. Glasses and mic don't work well together, I'm telling you. Okay. <laughs> I'm supposed to give you guys the heads up so you can be thinking. Um, in our family, particularly our one daughter, we are such huge fans of Bob Ross, the painter, right? And he's, he had a number of phrases that we repeat all the time in our family. So like, you know, it's just a happy little painting, but I, of course, say quilt or it's your painting, you can just put this little tree anywhere. And I have converted these phrases to quilting. Anyway, I guess for people listening to me, the feedback that I always get is your voice is so calming. I love listening to you, etc., etc. So my family has dubbed me the Bob Ross of quilting. So Dave's going to ask you in a poll kind of how you feel about that comparison. So be ready for that. Let's get quilting. 
I am quilting today on my Gamel Vision long arm. Uh, her name is Lucy. She has a 26 inch throat, so lots of space for quilting. And I'm just going to move my coffee out of the way and get one last sip in. So I'm just chatting with Dave here in the background. Dave, I have to walk around though and stand right yeah, okay. my back to it. Okay. Okay, so we're doing a bit of a different camera angle this morning than we've done in some of our other loads. Give us feedback on how this works for you, good, bad, or indifferent. So I'm going to show you my method of loading, which is pretty streamlined. Because I tend to do a lot of these edge-to-edge -edge quilts for clients, it matters to me that I'm efficient in my loading. In my whole process, really, but I have to move Lucy a little further, Dave. Are we okay for cords? This is always a bit of a balancing act, right? Because we have phone cords and USB cables with limited length and a big old machine that we're trying to maneuver. So I use the red snapper system, but this method would work also for pinning. So basically, I am going to attach the side of the quilt that's nearest to me, and I want that edge to be straight. That's going to be the basis on which my quilt gets attached to the long arm. So I need at least one straight side, but not all of them have to be straight, as you will see as we go on. So pinning might take a little longer, but with the red snappers, lickety-split. I will have this front affixed. I might add here, too, the red snapper system comes with very short, I'll show you, tiny red pieces, like so. And they recommend that you kind of baste your quilt edge and then go back and put the big clips on. I prefer to just, I have this long unattached bit. I lay it down. I make sure my fabric is smooth. And then I grasp it and just hold it in place with my left hand and go back and attach it all with my right. Again, in the interests of speed. You do what works for you. If you haven't done a ton of quilts and you're not sure you're getting it straight, take the time to put those little basting bits in place. But for me, this is effective. I make sure, I take great care actually, that I don't pull too hard on my fabric and stretch it. This is not a selvage edge. So I could overextend it. I'm taking care not to. And I know that's working because I don't see any funny pulling creases. You know, it should lay perfectly smoothly coming out of my red snapper. few little ones on the end and then we'll see how this works because I'm going to come around with my back to you but basically I'm going to throw the remainder of the backing all the way over the frame and let it hang down the other side grab me a couple of snappers so here it's important that I get the fabric on the straight of grain. So this is where if the outer, the left and right edges of my quilt were not perfectly straight, or in fact, this top end of my quilt is not perfectly straight, I'm still going to roll it onto the frame flat and smooth. So it's important that I do have it flat and smooth. And again, I can judge that. If it's canted a little bit to one side, I'll be seeing some sort of diagonal creases or folds. Um, which camera am I on? Sorry, Dave. Okay, good. So it's important that this hangs flat and straight. And even if your backing is long and extends way off onto the floor, smooth it all out so it's as straight as you possibly can. Uh, undo my clips. And now I will just start rolling it on. And since it is so beautifully smooth and straight, it's just going to roll straight and square onto my backing or onto my leaders. So I'm just watching from the other side, you can't see me, to where I have about an inch extending beyond my leaders. And I'll pause right there. In this case, I do have my seam running top to bottom vertically. In general, I prefer to do my seam running from side to side. But the reason I'm doing it this way is because I'm loading the quilt 
long ways is from side to side so that I have fewer passes on it and it's just more efficient. And I know this particular sewer, the maker of the top, and I assessed this backing and it's nice and flat. If my seam had any pucker in it or I thought there might be any issues, I would have probably taken the time to load it the other way so that my seam would run from side to side. That tends to be easier to deal with. If the seam is at all tight, you can get a little bit of pulling in the center. So once again, I'm kind of anchoring my red snapper. You probably can't see me with my left hand and then going back and snapping it all into place with my right. Putting my last two little red snappers on there and it's all done. So then I come back around the long way, finish rolling it up, and just like that, I have a backing loaded, nice and smooth. Beautiful. Okay, batting. I'm using Hobbs 8020, which is my very favorite all purpose batting. It is 80% cotton, 20% poly, very washable. It is a little softer, I find, than 100% cotton, and so does not crease when a quilt is folded. So I like that quality. I personally prefer it to 100% cotton. Different quilt makers have preferences based on, you know, how much shrinkage they want, those sorts of things. So it's not a right or wrong answer. It's just my preference. It's also very economical, so my clients like it too. Okay, we have a question. Is that an extension on the back? Oh, good question, Jana. I can hardly get in the camera to see you. Jerry, so sorry. See, I need my, I don't know what I need, glasses or no. It is an extension. Um, the backing was a little bit close to the width of the quilt, because this is the width of my quilt when it's finished. And so, yes, my client very kindly put a four inch extension on there just to give me a little more leeway to quilt with. And so I'm able to put my batting and in fact my quilt very close to the end of her finished backing. In case anyone is wondering, I'll add too, her backing is super, super cute. It has little koalas on it. And it is a directional fabric and she and I discussed it and she chose not to worry about the direction. They're very small and they in fact run side to side on the quilt but she and I agreed that that was okay. So can you see the fabric? It's little koalas and sloths on the front. Whoever thought a sloth could be cute, but yes, yes indeed they can. And the backing is all koalas. Super cute. This lady, not surprisingly, is making quilts for the grandkids. This is my very favorite kind of quilting to do. You know, they're well-made quilts, they're pretty, they're artistic, but they're just intended to be loved and used. And that is what I love about doing freehand edge to edge quilting. It is, in my opinion, the most economical way. Obviously, more economical for time than custom, but to my thinking, even more economical than pantographs because no lining up is needed. I'm just going to base this down and start quilting just like that. Hang on, we're messing with cables. And I'm just going to lower my leaders a little bit. Of course, the last thing I had on here was my big fat custom quilt, right? And so I'm going to get a bunch of bounce in there if I leave that leader so high. All right. So I've already got my thread loaded. I'm using 100% isocor 100% poly, sorry, thread. Isocord is the brand. And I have color 0151, which is kind of a gray with tones of khaki in it. But it blends very well with many things. It's one of my favorite neutrals. So I'm going to baste up the left side. You certainly could baste with a larger basting stitch. In the interest of time, I just baste with the same stitch I'm going to use for quilting. Right up the left side, I'm going to shorten, sorry, lengthen my stitch length. I've got it set at 12 per inch, which is kind of my typical, whoa, hang on. I thought I had my channel lock on and I did not. So 
So now I do have my channel lock on. Not all machines have this, but mine does. It's a magnetic lock so that my machine now cannot move higher or lower. It's making a perfectly straight line. So for this reason, I can often avoid pinning my quilt top on because I've got that straight line to guide me and I'm just going slowly enough that I can make micro adjustments, if you will, with my hand to keep the edge of the quilt. Okay, I'm chuckling now. I have got it turned on and it shows on on my screen, but it is not locked. Dave, have we got a cord in the way? Because you can hear it's not locking. Tis a puzzlement. Have you guys ever watched The King and I? That's his favorite phrase. Tis a puzzlement. Okay, well, I'm not going to stop to ponder. I am now freehanding a straight line. Because my channel locks are not clicking on. Usually I can hear them because it is a magnet. It makes a little bonk. So we do not have the benefit of a channel lock today. And still, it can be done. Again, if you're newer to this and don't feel as confident about it, take the time to lay down a yardstick or something straight and put a few pins in there to hold things square and straight. It's worth keeping your quilt as straight as you can. You'll get a much better result if you put a little time into getting it nice and square and straight. And usually I cheat with my channel locks. That gives me a perfect 90 degree horner and I love it. All right, we are mostly loaded, ready to go. I now I'm going to put my little, uh, where can you see me? Do, 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 do. My magnetic bars, there you go, right across the front of the quilt. I'm floating the top, which means I'm just letting it hang down right in front of me. But I also want to secure my working area so that it cannot pull up into my quilting area as I quilt. And so my magnetic bars do that for me. They hold everything nice and secure. Because I'm weird, I always start quilting at the top right hand corner. I think that's because that's usually where I am with the basting. And so I usually just buzz up to the top corner and proceed into my quilting. And now it's habit. So I'm just taking a sec to put my stretchers on the left and right side. I like to baste first so that when I put this little tension on, it's on the whole quilt, not just on the backing. And I like these wide stretchers that cover or pull on most of the quilting area. Mine are 18 inches wide, and so they cover a great deal of my quilting space and puts that nice even tension on the edge. Um, in case you're wondering, where's the best place that you can see me? Not there. Um, it's difficult to see but I'll kind of show you. I've got my fingers under the quilt right there. I keep my quilt loose enough that I can actually grasp my fingers under there. There's not a ton of excess, but I can. It's not so drum tight that I couldn't do that. However, it appears smooth and tight. I don't like any sag in it. So that's kind of a balancing act. Too tight and you will get, you'll mess with the tension and stitch formation and be apt to get broken threads or even broken needles if it's tight enough. So today we're quilting what I call oak-ish leaves. They're not really like oak leaves, but they're closer to oak leaves than any other leaf I know. So oak-ish leaves, we call it. And I'll show you one more precautionary measure I take before I keep launching into the rest of the quilt. Once I'm stitching at sort of full speed, I run my fingernail along the stitching line underneath and if my bottom thread is too tight, I will hear almost like as though there were a little ladder or railroad ties going on under there. And so that's not happening so that I know my stitch um, formation is good from the bottom and obviously I can see it from the top. So I'm pretty confident in that. So I don't run a separate tension check unless I'm really having trouble. And I know each quilter has their own philosophy about that. I'm just telling you mine. And we're 
up and away. Mr. Producer is saying something to me. Ah, he's telling me the slower the better. We're getting some vibrations going on. Okay, I'll slow down a little. Maybe what we'll do in a bit for those that are interested is we'll switch um, to the camera that's not affixed to the machine and I'll do it sort of at full speed, what would be my usual speed for you? Because that is a question I get asked quite a lot. You know, how fast do you go? Um, I do think that's a very individual thing. So really the short answer is you go at the speed that's comfortable for you. These live and unscripted episodes are, of course, on real quilts, which usually means prints. So I'm not honestly sure how much of the quilting design you're able to get from this. But this is more a um, 10,000 foot view. You know, you get to see how I handle the quilt as a whole, how I move around the quilt with my design, those sorts of things. Maybe chime in in the comments. Am I going slow enough that you can see or is the vibration driving you nuts? Feel free to ask questions. No question is too tiny. And usually I stop at the end of each pass and take some questions and comments while I'm rolling and advancing. My basic design is that I'm just setting a spine in the middle, kind of an S-curve spine. Uh, the curve is entirely dependent on where I'm trying to go next. You can curve a lot or a little, left or right, doesn't matter. And then just laying two to three um, lobes, if you will, on the leaf. And then I do this kind of pointed end on it. And that's all it is. Sizes vary, numbers of lobes vary, depending on the space I'm trying to fill in. And as always, I will post some pictures after the fact on my social media so you can get a better look at the detail of the quilting. I'm gonna pause for a sec. How are we doing for sound and vibration in general? Okay, I might turn it on to um, the non-stitch regulated and see if that goes better or worse. So let me know. Um, we can do it now. There I am. Jill, would you please sketch your design on the Plexi and show how they connect? Thank you. New viewer from Colorado. Um, I can try and do that when I come to the end of this pass. I'll be honest with you, Jill. I don't usually make these edge-to-edges so much instructional in terms of teaching these designs 
as in showing you the overall quilt and picture. Um, I can for today. The other thing that I keep in the back of my mind is I do have students in a freehand quilting master class and I want to honor the fact that they have purchased that class and not show the patterns that I go into in depth in that class. This however isn't one of them so it's kind of a safe bet in that way. But um, yeah, do you remember this is kind of how I make my living too. So I'm trying to give as much good value as I can and not give away all the secrets if that makes sense. Jerry, how do you get that nice uniform size? Do you gauge it with something? Oh gosh. I don't, Jerry. I, ooh, I'm trying to get on camera. There we go. Um, part of it is experience and, and practice. I've done this design quite often. Part of it is they are not super uniform. I'm fitting in small ones or larger ones into the areas that I have. But I will give you one tip. Um, let me fix out, fish out my plexi when I'm at the end of this pass. And I will draw a leaf for the lady that was asking. And I will give you my best keeping the scale consistent tip. Susan, do you cover the full surface that expo is exposed top to bottom or lengthwise? Um, I'm starting at one side, one corner, and I'm working my way across the entire area that's exposed. Again, I know from experience how close I can quilt to this front rail without bumping into it. If you don't know where that is on your machine or you're having trouble with bumping up against it from time to time, a tip is to lay a piece of painter's tape across the front at a kind of barrier and then you know where to end. And then yes, I cover all the area that remains. And when doing a particular design, do you follow the same path from quilt to quilt so that you pretty much know where you're heading every time you do that design? Also, do you ever use variegated thread? I do largely follow the same path. It varies a little bit from design to design because some of them are not as freeform, if you will. I just kind of zigzag across the quilt. What was the second part of that question? Do you use variegated thread? Personally, I don't love variegated thread. I'll tell you why as I'm quilting. How does that sound? And I'm sorry, I can't pronounce your first name. You're from South Africa. How high is your machine set up belly bar height? Thanks from South Africa. Um, I couldn't tell you the inches, but for me, it's like rib cage height. It's not very far below the bust line. And I know that's much higher than typical. This is because most of my work is this type of edge to edge design. And the way that my machine is built in terms of visibility, this height works well for me. I know many other quilters will recommend, you know, about four inches lower. My recommendation is you try a couple quilts at different heights and see what feels good for you in terms of your neck in terms of your shoulders, visibility, all that stuff. Okay, so let's go on and talk about thread for a minute. And I took it, I went back to stitch regulation because I can't both <laughs> stitch on a constant speed and think and talk at the same time. So for threads, this is my personal philosophy. When I'm doing this edge to edge type of quilting, I want the thread to take a back row seat, so to speak, to the quilt design. I want it to be the supporting actor, not the star of the show. To that end, I want it to not be highly contrasting in any area. But this quilt is a great example. You can see that I've got the significantly darker border plus the quite a bit lighter areas. So I aimed for a thread that was kind of in the middle. It's a bit darker than the light areas and quite a bit lighter than the dark areas. And I feel like that hits a nice middle of the row, middle of the road. So now back to your question, do you use variegated thread? The reason I don't is because I cannot control where those colors hit on the fabric. So they might contrast very highly in some places and they might almost disappear in other places. And I don't love that look. That is strictly personal opinion. I know there are quilters and quilt makers out there who love variegated thread. Go for it. Okay, now I am going to switch to the constant speed. You'll see that now my needle is just going to go at a fixed rate and it is up to me to um, adjust my stitch length by how fast I am moving my machine head. Here we go.
Dave, my machine is having a problem because I did change it and it's not changing. So we're going to go back to our regulated and we're stuck with that for today and I'm going to have to do a little bit of troubleshooting when the day is over. It's basically those changes I make on my little tablet on my machine and nothing is changing when I push the buttons. We saw that with my channel locks too, so probably it just needs a good reboot. So for today, we are stuck in this style of stitching. This is probably a design where it would benefit you to do some doodling with it and kind of get comfortable with how you are moving around the quilt. I will take the time to show you on Plexi how I form the one leaf. And then as I keep on quilting, I think you'll be able to see some of my tricks for moving from one to another or for traveling when I want to go to a different area on the quilt or when I need to kind of fill in a corner that's been left, those sorts of things. And it's much the same tricks that you'll hear lots of quilters give you, which is one is trap as, um, sorry. See, it is hard to talk and quilt at the same time. <laughs> one trick is to echo, and I'm certainly utilizing that. When I need to move back into a little area and get some quilting coverage in there, I'll just echo around what I've already quilted. And that is always a good solution. One of the other beauties of freehand is it's valued because it is freehand. It's not perfect and it's not entirely uniform. And so that also gives you freedom. If some leaves are larger or smaller or curved very differently from others, that just adds to its artistic quality. I don't know if you could see, I echoed around that entire leaf, which I have not typically done, but because I wanted to get up into this specific area, I did it on this one. I will make sure that I do that a few times throughout my quilt so that it doesn't look like a one-off. Does that make sense? So even if I needed to insert a funny little leafy shape to fill up an awkward corner, that would be totally fine. I would just make sure I put said funny little leafy shape in several places throughout the quilt, then it looks like part of my design, right? I'm just picking some threads off here before I sew them on. If any of you are interested, I have a Pinterest page 
Um, my account is Stitched by Susan, and I have a tips and tutorials page, and one of the things on that page is a printable PDF, how to make your long armor your best friend. And on it are some of my favorite tips, some are very commonly heard ones, some less so, about things that I love that my quilt makers do to make my job easier and honestly more efficient and less costly for them as well. That PDF you are free to print and distribute if you like, if you have long arming clients. But one of them, not surprisingly, is to pick the threads off the top as best as best they can. And this lady is pretty darn good. Again, I'm going to go around because I need to fill in this corner up at the top of the quilt. I'm going to pretend like that leaf went right off the edge. And you can see I'm making these very different shapes, some of them. So this is honestly a really forgiving design. You can stretch or squeeze these leaves into any number of different shapes. I probably could get one more in there, but I'm going to choose instead to go out to the edge of the quilt and do my advance. I don't want to risk bumping into the front rail. So I just put my needle down when I end, and I leave that needle in when I'm advancing, as a rule. Anyways, take all my magnets off. Um, I do not think I'll reboot my tablet. I think it's satisfactory as is. We'll just continue going. I'll do that after the session. So I'm just undoing all my safeguards. I took my magnets off the front, my side clamps off the side, and now we're ready to advance. And I just have to raise my rail a little. The red snappers are a wee bit bulky, so that's just something to consider when you're rolling up, but you'll feel it if there's resistance. I think we're going to be able to do this quilt in three passes. I think, I think. So I use my whatever seams are in the quilt as a kind of visual guide along my front rail to make sure that everything is straight and flat. I also kind of grab with my nails. Where am I that you can see me? Here we go. I just kind of grab and do gentle tugs. I find that the batting, if just left to do its own thing when you roll it up, tends to pull up a bit especially in the middle. So I just give it that little tug to make sure that everything is smooth and not tight, but no wrinkles allowed in there. And then I smooth the fabric down over the front and do my basting on both sides again. I also like to alternate the direction of my passes. So my first pass I quilted from right to left. This one I'm going to quilt from left to right. This keeps things looking organic and flowing and the quilting you know, path is not very evident. No matter what my design is, I pretty much always alternate 
directions of the quilting path. I'm just moving slowly to be sure I'm not. There is resistance, Dave. I'm pulling on something. One of the days that I was quilting last week, we had little gremlins in the studio, as we sometimes do, and we knocked over the one tripod with camera, not one, not two, but three times during the course of that session, just by doing that simple thing, moving the long arm and a cord catches on one of those rails that stick way out the back, you know how that is? So I try and move around gingerly. Okay, I've basted both sides. And sure, we'll take some questions. I'm just going to put my stretchers on while we do that. So I've determined what the resistance is, by the way. I didn't raise my um, take-up bar quite enough. And so right in under the bottom of my roller is my red snapper, and it's kind of taking up space in there. So I'm just going to raise my roller just a little bit more. And there you go, that let Lucy loose. There was just that little bit of resistance going on. And you get to where you can feel that with your machine. There's all kinds of little things that you know aren't quite right. And you just learn to do that by feel. OK, we have some questions? Uh, wherever's comfortable, right there. OK. Dave's going to throw the questions on the screen. Uh, okay. This pretty little decorative thing, by the way, is holding my mic in place. Susan Tapp, I see how you are scattering the leaves across a section. Is this so you keep the quilt flat and not push the batting into an area? Basically, Susan, I'm working. I started in one corner, right? And I'm just kind of doing this diagonal moving up and down. And so the batting is not really going to push because it's held by my magnets in the front, which I have to put on, and it's basted on the side. So it's not really going anywhere in terms of edge to edge quilting. That's just for the ease of movement. And I want to keep it looking organic and natural. Patricia, it looks like it's so easy, but I'm not sure it is. Well, it did take some practice. I'll give you that. <laughs> Mine is high also. Yes. To me, I find that comfortable when I'm doing this edge to edge type of work. That's it. OK, so I did promise that I would get out my plexi and show you a quick leaf. So Dave's going to put the overhead camera on and we'll just see how it shows. I'll do it on a light area and I'll do it a bit big. So hopefully you can see it well, reasonably well. Let's do it down here. So basically, I'm doing an S shape and echoing it back. And then I'm putting generally one, two, three, and one, two, three lobes on it. That's the basic shape. One of the questions was, one of the questions was about keeping the size consistent, right? And, and so this is partially my answer to that as well. When I when I start a design, like at the beginning corner of a quilt, I will often quilt a little bit and then looking at that or tracing that or depending on how complex it is, is how far I go with that, I will draw on my plexiglass sheet or even a piece of paper what I'm quilting at the same size I'm quilting it. Does that make sense? So if I had flowers, I would do them the same size. In the case of this leaf, they're mostly about this size. And I might draw two or three on there. And then I'll keep this sheet for the duration of my quilt. So every time I advance my quilt, I'll have a look back at this again and say, oh, hey, are my leaves in general getting way bigger or getting way smaller? And I can make that adjustment by referring to my scale, if you will. In terms of traveling, I'll do a big one again. This is my very simple answer. There's more than one way of traveling, but this is one really useful one, I think. So there's my leaf. What I don't want to do is get several leaves going out from this point, all beginning there, right? So my answer to that is, after I've completed my leaf, I always echo one of the lobes. And then I launch into my next leaf. So when this leaf finishes, I'll be back, you know, say here. I'll echo one lobe. 
and again, launch to wherever I'm going. Does that help? So that's my tip for this particular design for traveling. And this one, first half of and. Do you follow the same path from quilt to quilt? I think I think I addressed that by saying I use this kind of diagonal fashion of moving um, for these very free flowing ones. That's typically what I do just so that I don't get a funny little area at the top that hasn't been quilted and I've got all this close to me done. Right. So I just zigzag my way across the quilt like that. Thank you. Jill, thank you. You are so welcome. I imagine you're getting a sense from watching me that this I'm an ambassador for edge to edge quilting. I don't think that it has to be dull and I don't think that it has to be a lesser form of quilting. It can be very beautiful and there's endless inspiration and variety. And you're seeing with these leaves, like it's pretty. There's nothing sort of substandard about this type of edge to edge quilting, but it's fast from my point of view and therefore very economical for the owner of the quilt. And they still get the beauty thereafter. So I've just locked my thread on the left and we're off. So there I echoed that one lobe. I don't know if you saw that. Watch on this one, I'll point it out. One, two, three, one, two, three, and I echo one back. And then I can curve off in whatever direction I want my next leaf to be. And it's just that simple. If you try this design on your quilts, I would absolutely love if you would post pictures, Instagram or Facebook, whichever you happen to be on more, but tag me in them if you would. Susan Smith or Stitched by Susan, either one I will see. This time I'm going to echo the whole leaf because I want to do another one over on this side. And remember I said earlier I had echoed a whole leaf and I would make a point of doing that a few times throughout the quilt. That's what I'm doing. And then it looks on purpose, part of the plan. And we've just run out of bobbin thread. See, this is reality TV right here. So what I do when I run out of thread, it probably does not show on camera. But because I just run until my bobbin ends, the last few inches do not have tension on them, proper tension. So you have to do a couple inches of undoing. And I choose to undo to the last sort of point corner because that's an unobtrusive place to put my splice. So I'm just undoing to the last little point that had good tension on it. And of course, when you're trying to hurry, that doesn't happen. Does it? And also that point is kind of naturally reinforced by having, you know, when you hit a point, it makes a couple three stitches right there. So just grabbing my bobbin from underneath and I'm just going to run for another bobbin off camera. I do wind my own bobbins. I just have a freestanding winder. And when I start with one bobbin, I load the next one and set it going. So it takes that long to replace bobbins. And that way I'm able to match my top and bottom thread, which is my preference also. Okay, we have a question. Jerry, do you have thread breakage from time to time due to the direction you're going? My machine is picky with left to right. This is a thing that many long armors have. And I'll be honest, my Lucy is pretty good about it. I do quite a bit of um, straight line quilting. So left to right and right to left. And am I on this camera? There we go. Um, and I've got Lucy to where she can stitch both ways pretty well equally. Something that you might try is turning your needle just a hair. So, you know, if you think of the eye of your needle as facing dead on six o'clock toward you, try it at 530 or at 630, just a little. And basically what that does is changes ever so slightly the speed w when the rocker from the bobbin thread is passing your needle and that stitch formation. So that's just adjusting that a little bit. And sometimes that alone is enough to fix that problem. So give it a try. Um, but that is a really common thing, sadly, that I hear from quilters. I'm fortunate that Lucy is very comfortable going both ways.
and I'm going to take just a second to clip my threads. I always stitch a little ways before I clip. If I do it too soon, like right after I've done the lock stitch, it just pulls out. So once again, let me know in the comments, are you happy with this as another addition to your repertoire of masculine designs? They can be hard to come by. So when I find inspiration for a new one, I always latch right on to it. Again, I'm echoing all the way around one because I want to put a few more in this corner down here. I have a tiny corner here, so I'm going to put in a tiny one. So your scale is not a thing that you're locked into by any means. This quilt seems to be going pretty smoothly, but sometimes I even do leaves that have just one side. I'll maybe do one here for you just for cuz. So I'm doing my S curve quite close to another leaf that already existed. and only putting lobes on one side. So truly, this design is really forgiving. But you would see that in nature, wouldn't you? You would see a leaf that was folded right in half. And so I feel like that is fitting. Again, I'm going all the way around the leaf. And I had to do some creative stitching to get out of that corner. All I did was try and keep a similar idea of my graceful S curve. And then I just did what I needed to do to get out of that corner. I feel like as long as it doesn't look vastly different, it will not catch the eye. I occasionally will even drop just a lone S-curve with no lobes at all into a little spot that needs filling. And I think that looks just fine.
That one got very long. I actually put four lobes on one side of it. I don't do that too often because I think the leaf starts looking very elongated. I tend more to lean toward two than to four. However, in a pinch, needs must. I also think right here, I'm gonna cross back over one of my earlier lines. That looks perfectly fine too. So one more way to get out of a bind. And here again, I'm gonna cross right over. Choices. I wish I had come down a little closer to my front bar because I don't know if I'm going to get this all now in another pass. But I'm not going to worry about it. That is just a matter of another minute. I have not gone back to my original idea of um, changing cameras and going at higher speed because speed is such an individual thing. So I don't really want to show you a speed and say, this is what you're aiming for because it really doesn't matter. It's whatever is comfortable for you. I tend to do a lot of my freehand work with the stitch regulator off. Um, I find it smoother and I certainly find it more pleasurable to quilt without this steady revving and slowing of the motor. Um, and when I'm doing that type of stitching, I have a really good gauge for the speed that is my happy place. When I'm feeling rushed, like I need to hurry to figure out where to go next and just a little bit tense and anxious about it, I've just got that speed set too fast. And all I need to do is slow it down a little. And when I'm feeling like, you know, it's lagging, I'm waiting on my machine and or my stitches are getting a bit long because I'm skipping out in front of my machine, that's a sign I need to speed it up a little. So that's how I measure that. But the actual number doesn't matter at all. Again, echoing an entire leaf, so I get back up into this area that needs filling. I'm going to put in a tiny one.
there I'm going to put in just a little S-curve because I thought I had an awkward corner there that I couldn't fit an entire leaf into. And that worked really fine, I think. Here I'm going to echo two because I really want to get maybe the whole leaf. I really want to get over into this area that I left unquilted. And the smaller one's going to fit in here. Still three lobes, it's just on a smaller scale. Oops, sorry about that noise. A little too fast. Here we are at the edge. Okay, any comments while I advance? Okay, where's the best place to park Lucy? Alrighty, I will leave needle down and I will just undo all my stretching apparatus while we look at some questions. Okay. Yep, right there. Jill, when will you choose freehand edge to edge instead of using a digital pantograph? Oh, that's an easy one for me to answer, Jill. I have never, that's not true, you said a digital pantograph. I've never used a paper pantograph. Um, digital pantographs I use occasionally, very occasionally. Honestly, for my clients, I offer them at a slightly lower price than my freehand for kind of obvious reasons because I don't have to do all of it physically myself. Because it's not a thing I do a lot of, I don't have a huge variety of patterns, so my clients seldom choose that, like probably less than 2%, less than 2 in 100. Um, so in general, this is my preference. Robin, I realize watching you that I need to make my oak leaves a little plumper. Um, I think plump looks better. Play with that by all means. I also think a curve looks better than a very gentle swell. Renee, good morning. Is there a certain stitch length you're shooting for? Well, when I have my regulated stitch on, I have it at 12. So when I have unregulated on, I aim for it to look the same. Is, yeah. Annabelle, hmm. I'm sorry I'm leaning funny, but Lucy is in the way of me seeing the camera, and so, and I can't really move her. She's attached. I think I'll try stitching without the regulator today. I have never tried that. Give it a try. Uh, start slower, don't rush yourself, and use that kind of gauge that I mentioned to you, and that will probably grow as you get more comfortable with it. I think that it's smoother, especially when you're doing curvy things, like some kind of loopy design. It's easier to do round curves without the stitch regulator on, my opinion. Patricia, I don't have a gamble, but I love the noise it makes. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, it's gentle in my microphone, too. It's, it's, it's a machine. It sounds like a machine. <laughs> Susan, at some point, can you show us your natural speed that you quilt when not on camera? Dave's, Dave's talking to me off camera here. 
he feels like I should reboot my tablet and try to do it non-regulated and that would give you the more natural feel of how I quilt. So we'll give that a try while I'm advancing the quilt. I will reboot my tablet and see if we can get it to be responsive. I have honestly not had this happen before. So we're going to restart. Okay, we'll let that think for a minute while we advance the quilt. Every so often I need a reboot too, so I can't really blame the tablet. Rebooting for me usually involves a cup of coffee. Yes, I cannot quite do this in one pass. So then I'll come across and show you this so you can see how I make this decision. So I've got the edge of my quilt is right here. This is my floating top, right? It's not attached. I cannot get it all you know, all into my working space in this pass. So now I just want to leave enough here that I can still put my magnets in place. If I don't, because there's so little of this and it's so lightweight, if I just basted the sides and started quilting, this would pull up into my quilting and I would have a lovely little frown on the side of my quilt. So those magnets are super helpful. So once again, I'm giving a small tug to the batting to make sure there's no wrinkles forming under there. I'm gauging my seam line here to make sure that this is straight. I am doing it by eye. You know, I could lay something straight across there too, but I feel like I do a pretty good job gauging it by eye. And then I'll put my magnets across the front. I could do this before or after the basting. It doesn't matter. So now that working area is fixed. That is not going to pull up out of my straight position. Okay, I did say restart. Uh, let's see. Just takes a moment. This, by the way, is my little thread collector cup for trimmings, and I just keep my marking utensils and my seam ripper in it. I'm the queen of low-cost tools, and my machine happens to have a peg right on top upon which I have impaled it. Okay, let's get this basting line in and then see where we're at. So one of my basting tips, yeah, is a good angle you can see. Even on the flattest quilt, if I just sew down the edge without any interference from me, almost for sure it will push my fabric. The hopper foot will push my fabric just a little. So I do one of two things. I'm running my fingers in front and making sure the fabric feeds under, or I'm grasping the edge right behind the stitched area and just putting a little bit of tension on there. It just keeps that fabric feeding smoothly under the needle. And of course, if my border had any sort of ripples in it, I'd be pulling harder, basically. Really uneven quilts is a whole other conversation. Gingerly moving the machine and the camera. Here's something else that you can see actually pretty well here. On this side, you're seeing my batting doesn't reach all the way out to the edge, right? I didn't want to waste that much batting. But what has happened now is there's so many layers in the center rolling up that this, because it doesn't have those layers, is hanging loose. On this small quilt, it's probably not an issue, but if it was a bigger quilt, what I would do is grab the last layer and pull it snug and I would put one of my corsage pins right through my leader and just hold that so that this is not sagging so badly. And in fact, I may do it today because it's almost impossible to put a stretcher on a sagging backing. So that pin, and of course I have to remember to take that out when I'm unrolling the quilt, or I'll have a badly bent pin, ask me how I know, but um, it really helps just to take up that excess in the backing. There's just a funny little wrinkle on the edge of this. There we go. 
there's a very narrow channel that I have to get the edge of the fabric into to get the stretcher on. I'm going to give you guys one more great tip. Dave, would you hand me one of those yardsticks in the window? This also sometimes will sag just because of the weight. Uh, you can't really see it on camera, but you know what I mean. The weight of whatever clamp system you're using. And especially if you have a ruler plate or you're quilting near the edge, that can interfere when it's bumping up against the bottom of your long arm underneath. So here's my trick. Any stick that's long enough to span that space and wherever you need to place it that will just hold this up enough that this edge doesn't clank into the bottom of your machine underneath. Make sense? Experiment with it. You'll see what I mean totally. And by the way, this yardstick comes from my grandfather's hardware store and it's older than I am for sure. One of my little treasures. Okay, let us take constant off and see what happens. Well, yeah, I can do the magnets and see if that's working. One sec. Nope. So, you know, I think we'll fiddle with this after, Dave. This, this is the, there I am. This is the joy of having anything electronic on your machine. My last machine had like nothing electronic on it. It just had those magnets. So now I'm dealing with an interface and Bluetooth connections and so forth. So I'm not going to do it during the episode though, Dave. Let's just go ahead here and we'll have to troubleshoot afterwards to see why my tablet is not responding. Fortunately, I'm still able to quilt. The quilting apparatus itself is not electronic. Only the interface with things like the magnets and changing my speed and stitch length and so forth. Sure, we have a question on the basting. I'll move Lucy. Look, my head's been cut off. <laughs> Patricia is asking, when I baste my border, I start at the bottom and go up. I shouldn't? No, not a, like, I'm not saying that at all. You can do it whichever way is more comfortable for you. I think the rationale for that is maybe so that if you have any excess fabric in there, you, you know where you're starting at the bottom and you fit in all that excess before you bump up against your next stitching. That's totally fine too. I just happened to do it. I began where I left off and, and so down. I think either way works. Okay, so last pass was left to right, so this time we're going to start at the right-hand side and go left. I am moving out of camera. My top tension is looking just a little tight to me, so I'm going to I'm going to loosen that up just a hair. And I can tell because it's looking a little straight, a little like I'm not seeing individual stitches, and there's a tiny bit of pull at the corners of my oak leaves. So I'm just loosening my top tension. I'll stitch a couple leaves and I'll have another look at it, and I'll also do my fingernail test on the bottom to be sure I haven't overdone my adjustment. So it's looking real good here. Let's just have a feel. It's good below. So we're golden. Now, as I showed you, I've only got a very small amount left at the bottom of my quilt beyond what my current working space is. It's gonna be difficult to move around at the bottom if I just have a six inch space. So I'm actually not going to quilt this full working width. I'm just going to take a little bit of width all the way across, if that makes sense. And then I'm going to go ahead and roll and get that bottom edge basted and have a nice, you know, at least a foot wide to quilt on at the bottom. You'll see what I mean in case my words didn't make sense. And they don't always.
there. I'm going to do just a little tiny S curve in there just because I felt like that space is too tiny for a leaf, too big to leave unquilted. So I'm just curious, how many of you are at home quilting this morning also, and this is just kind of your background noise? And if so, what are you working on? I'd love to know. At the end of this little pass, we'll stop and get our pole in too. So if you haven't answered that already, jump in and do it, please.
This is going to be a one-sided one. And right off the edge. Stop right there and advance and base that bottom edge. So I think you can get a pretty good view here of why my client put the um, extender on the other end. Look how close I am to the edge of the quilt. So if she had not done that, the backing was wider than the quilt, but only by about, mm, at most, three inches. That's cutting it a little close, you know? If anything goes askew, um, I might have been in trouble there. So she was very considerate and put that little leader on for me couple ways that I can approach this. My way most frequently, I'll be totally honest, is to eyeball this straight front edge and use my channel lock to keep it straight and adjust as I go. However, as you've seen, my channel lock is not working today. And certainly if I wasn't confident in, you know, eyeballing it, this is what I would do. I would just run pins along, oh, every four inches or thereabouts, and just fix that in place. So it keeps this edge straight and it also keeps it from pushing or pulling from side to side. Makes sense? So this is just one more precautionary measure to keep my quilt nice and square and straight. I'm using corsage pins so they're nice and sturdy so I'm able to do what I need to do to manipulate them and, and get them in through all these layers. I find that there are other just regular sewing pins that are this long, but they're not as sturdy and they just don't cut it, in my opinion. Corsage pins are the ticket. Okay. Oh, this camera? No, I'm not on this camera, Dave. I'm on that camera. <sighs> these cameras, it's bewildering. Robin, I have to bind today. Not my favorite job, but you were the one that said you machine bind, right? So at least, you know, that, that keeps it more speedy. Annabelle, I'm piecing a couple of quilt blocks. Nice. And Arlene, once I finish watching this, I'll be loading up a t-shirt quilt with fleece backing. I've done plain tops with fleece backs before, but not a t-shirt top. Fingers crossed. It, it always is a fingers crossed when you're trying something new, isn't it? It's a long armor. Donna, I'm experimenting with the border design you showed us yesterday. Fantastic. Please do show me how that turns out for you. And Lisa, I wish I was quilting. Working and listening for now. Binding a quilt tonight. Yeah, work sometimes gets in the way, doesn't it? <laughs> Annabelle, after this, I will go work on your master class lessons. Wonderful. And I'm just going to insert here. All the master class students should have gotten an email last night with upcoming lives and Q&As and things like that that are coming. So don't miss those. Carrie, I loaded a panel today to practice some ruler work. I also figured out airplay, so I'm watching you in the big screen. Oh, boy. <laughs> Do the wrinkles show too badly? <laughs> Patricia. Are the magnets only for the gamel, or can you buy them for any long arm? Um, so I did not buy them specifically for my long arm. I'll just grab one. They are just from the hardware store. Um, inexpensive magnets. All that matters is, are your rails magnetic? Not every rail is. Some frames have wooden rails or aluminum rails, in which case this will not work for you. There are other types of things like uh, tubes that are open on one side, almost like the red snapper, but bigger that you can snap over a rail. I've just always had a gamel which has iron rails, and so magnets are the ticket for me. Okay. Oh, are there more questions, Dave, or am I back to quilting? Cheryl Ann, after I finish watching you, I'm going to load some practice material and give it a try. Good. And, you know, if you're working on plain material for sure, 
don't be too hard on yourself because mine is not perfect either. There's crossovers and doubles up of stitching and things like that, but it doesn't show on a print. So don't be too hard on yourself if you're quilting on a solid, but still I'd love to see it. Michelle, Harbor Freight have the rulers for cheap. Do you mean the magnets, I presume? And yes, that's where I got mine too. Likewise, oh, the yard sticks. Now I understand. Yes. And the magnetic pin bowls as well. Very inexpensive at, at a Harbor Freight or other kind of big box hardware store. I do stitch over my pins. I know some quilters would be horrified. I don't do it fast, as you can see. I have yet, I have never yet broken a pin or a needle. And I'm doing this on a wing and a prayer because as you noted, I have no magnetic channel lock. So I'm just guiding it along. Here too, I'm just pulling with my fingernail a little bit on what has already been stitched. If I don't do that, this upper end pushes out of the way and kind of turns. Maybe that's just my machine, but I have to provide a little extra encouragement to keep things flat and smooth. All the pins are out and we're in business. Now I did go from right to left on the last pass, so I'm going to break thread here and go start at the left. I don't know honestly with this design that it's critical because they're moving in every direction, but that is just kind of my standard procedure. So I'm a creature of habit. There's just a little wrinkle in the edge of that fabric and I can't get it to grasp. So for this quilt, I'm just going to put two clamps on the side and call it good. Fairly gentle tension on that. My clamps are not on stretchy fabric. They're on fixed Velcro, so I have to be sure to not get them too tight. I don't want to get little scallops going on here, right? Okay, last pass, folks. As always with freehand designs, you can really play with them to A, make them your own, and B, to sort of find better ideas for things that you aren't thrilled with. I know in my early days of doing this design, I echoed the entire leaf on all sides and then launched into the next one. I thought it made it look kind of clunky and unwieldy, but those are the sorts of things that you can play with and find out how it pleases you. If I'm doing a flower, I will often mess with the petals, you know, make them short and wide, make them long and slim, and see what kind of look I go for. Make five, make seven, make three. So you can really change the look of it 
to make it your own. And also, if you're not pleased with how it's looking, try changing things. Oh, Dave, we forgot to do our poll. I'm pausing. Let's do our poll. Is Bob Ross of quilting a thing? Yes, let's go viral. See, I'm, I don't know which camera I'm in, hon. Oh, okay. That's fine. Who is Bob Ross? 9%. Okay, I'm going to help you people. You, you need to YouTube Bob Ross. So he's a painter and he's a very, well, he's not living anymore. So he, he was a painter and he had a TV show for a long time and he is utterly unique. His voice was just this calm, soft voice and he had this very relaxed, non-threatening approach to painting and he's just absolutely so fun to watch and he has this enormous afro of hair enormous head of curly hair like truly he's unique on all fronts anyway you just couldn't ruffle him he just had this soft little voice and these phrases that i was telling you about earlier like let's just put a happy little tree right here and so yeah i've adopted those for my own and i'm like i'm gonna put a happy little swirl right here and it's my quilt i'll make it however want it but you know not not uh with angst in my voice just this quiet little <laughs> anyway all that said i think i am going to start the hashtag bob ross of quilting so you guys are welcome to jump on board because honestly i think a bob ross in every field is not a bad thing Something you absolutely cannot see on camera is while I do this, particularly this last pass, I am constantly looking in every direction for what areas I still need to fill and where I need to travel next. So I'm kind of looking under my quilting head, looking at the front edge of my quilt, always gauging where shall I go next and how can I fill it in in the best possible way. Trying to avoid painting myself into an awkward corner. And you know, there's ways out of every corner, but it's my little quilter's puzzle. How can I do this in the most efficient way possible? My brain is always going that way. Did you see how hard I curved that one? And again, nature is like that. It has odd little things. And so I feel like that looks absolutely fine. And I do find that sometimes I quilt along that front edge of the quilt and then go back and fill in just because I don't want the edge of the quilt to look awkward, if that makes sense, or chopped off. But with these leaves, it is not a problem to go back and fill in those spaces that I've left behind. A little filler in there. Not sure how close you're seeing here, but I'm actually have a spot right up against my roller that I know I'm not going to be able to quite reach. I'm going to bump with my bar. I don't think you'll be able to see it on camera because it's right under the roller, but you're seeing me back up just a wee bit. I bet we've all learned from experience. It doesn't do to try and squeeze it in there because inevitably you get a thump when you hit the edge.
I don't think that particular leaf was a thing of beauty. But among so many leaves, it's just going to be fine. This one I have to echo to get back out. We need to fill in this little corner on the bottom that I've kind of left a little strip. So I'll go back and do that because then I can just travel my way out with um, in the in the edge what am i trying to say inside the basting line so there i've just laid a half a leaf in there I'm going to echo around this leaf and go all the way back to the top. I debated working my way out to the edge and then working my way back into this corner, which would have worked also. These are decisions I make on the fly. Which way shall I do it? No right or wrong answer, but I chose to echo all the way back in. If you'll remember, I've done a few of those whole leaf echoes throughout the quilt, so it won't look out of place. I'm just trying to be aware wherever there's any sort of large spaces that haven't got anything in them, I'm putting either a little tendril or a little partial leaf or something in there.
There's a little tendril. Again, has nothing to do with an oak tree or leaf, but because it kind of echoes the same S curve that we're using throughout, I feel like it's complimentary. In it goes. And we are once more out of bobbin thread. And I have slightly bad news for you guys. I did not think, I did think that my two bobbins would be enough, so I didn't set another one winding. So I'm just going to go do that off camera for a second I while I, um, then I'll come back and undo my few stitches that I talked about earlier. So we'll set that winding. It just takes a few seconds. And we'll undo my few stitches. A lot of machines, and mine too, have not so much bobbin sensors as you can program approximately how many revolutions of the bobbin it takes before it's empty, and then you'll get a bobbin notification almost empty. I choose not to because... I don't know, I think it wastes a fair bit of thread, and this works for me. I only ever have to undo, you know, two or three inches, and I usually go, as I said, to a little corner because my, my machine naturally puts a couple of stitches at whatever point I pivot at. That's a good stopping place and a good um, invisible place to put my splice. So my bobbin is now full. I'm grabbing it, and we're back in business. grasping my little bobbin. <laughs> um, oiling is often a question I get to, and every, every brand of machine has different recommendations. Gamel is one of those ones that says you can't oil too much, you should oil every bobbin. And I'll be 100% honest, I don't. I generally oil the bobbin area every quilt. So after this one is finished, I will go back and put my drop of oil in there. And then generally every day I do my full oiling. So if you have a gamel, that works for me. But even then, if I'm not quilting the whole day, I don't do it every day either. So that's my two cents. Pausing for a sec to clip my tails. So today's project will certainly be trying to figure out what's up with my um, notebook. My, what am I trying to say, Dave? My tablet. My tablet and see why it's not working. And I was kind of chuckling inwardly thinking, you know, maybe all it needs is another cup of coffee because that's what usually gets me going in the morning. And speaking of coffee. Oh, Mr. Producer Man is saying come back to it, so I will. I'll come back to the coffee story in a moment. You have to listen to the producer. I don't always in real life, but you know, when he's behind the camera, I have to. We're seeing the end. We are seeing the end. And a little tiny one in there.
These little koalas are so darn cute. Funny little space up there. I'm going to go ahead and put a little swirl in there because I don't feel like I can leave it unquilted. So again, it was just a little S-shaped tendril, which ideally I would not have put on the end of a leaf, but I thought that was less eye-catching than leaving a two-inch chunk of space unquilted. One more of those decisions I make on the fly. We were talking about scale a little bit earlier and I had my plexi sheet out. Another thing that I kind of consider before I begin a quilt is scale in terms of how close the quilting lines are together. So in my leaves here, I have quite a few one inch spaces, even one and a half inch spaces, and very few other than the stem that are less than a quarter inch. So I kind of keep that in the back of my mind when I'm making decisions on the fly about whether or not I need to fill in a little tendril or a leaf. So if my scale, for example, is between a quarter inch and one and a half, then if I've got a space that's significantly bigger than one and a half, then I feel like that's going to catch the eye and I need to go back and fill that in with something. And if I'm getting lines that are closer than a quarter inch, then I'm getting too tight. Does that make sense? That's just kind of my measuring stick and that can be different for every design that I'm quilting. And you see that to some extent more at the end of the quilt because I don't have this big expanse anymore to work across, right? So I've got to make decisions as I go. How much can I fit in here and how much is too much? So that's kind of how I approach it. Put a little tendril in there and we're going to lay one leaf along this edge. Just like that. We can make it happen with one more. Let's make a little echo into my basting line, a few anchor stitches, and we are finished. That's it, folks. So let's undo all our anchors. I will go ahead and take the quilt off of Lucy and try and hold it up for the camera so you can have a decent view. Uh, I'm not sure if it shows better on the backing, honestly, or on the front. It's a bit of a busy print. So I'm not sure if that will be helpful to you or not, but we'll give it a try.
So I like to start my quilts um, with my rail very close to the front, my red snapper rail. So I actually, when I'm unloading a quilt, I fix that in position with my snapper right here and clip it at both ends to hold it in position. And then I'm already ready and poised to load my next quilt while this is all held up here anyway and can't be flopping around the front of my machine. It's an easy time to do it. Okay, we have a few questions and or comments. Can I keep unrolling while we comment? All right, here come the comments. Here we are. Uh, Patricia, I just tried a small magnet on my long arm and it's working. Fantastic. I think you'll find that to be super helpful and, and an easy way to hold a floating top in place. Jill, did you just trim off thread on that point? No burying needed? No Thanks. That is correct, Jill. So I do four or five tight little stitches very close together at the beginning and end of my thread and then I just trim them both off. Yes. There are, there are times and places um, for tying and burying threads, but I assume you're asking about when I had the bobbin that I had to replace in them in the middle of the quilt. Yes. Because that's at a point of my stitching, there were a couple stitches right in that point when I ended and I overlapped them just, just a little and put a couple more lock stitches there when I began and then I just trimmed the threads off close. That seems to work well. Donna, my Gana loves, loves the oil. Yes. I, I do think it, it's probably true motor wise that you can't over oil it but when I have oil dripping on my quilts then then it's got to be too much Elizabeth I always think of your mom and how proud she'd be of all your accomplishments so for those of you watching Elizabeth is my cousin our mothers were sisters and quilt makers so yes neither of them are living anymore but yes they would be glad to know that we still make quilts okay let us unload It's catching. Oh, do you know what that is? Do you know what that is? My pin. Nobody reminded me. I can't believe it. So there was a question a little way back from Donna asking if I check for pins in the quilt before loading. Um, honestly, I have not typically found that to be a problem. However, I do a couple of things. I usually put the quilt out flat. I have a big old cutting table and I usually flop the quilt on that flat because I like to measure before I load it. I charge by the square inch, so I measure before I load. So that would give me a good view if there were any pins in it. I think I've only once, if you want stories, I think I've only one time had it happen where there was a pin and it was on the backing of a quilt. Um, the maker had for some reason marked something with a safety pin. And you know, I quilted that whole thing with a pretty dense pattern and I never hit the head of that safety pin. So when the quilt was done and I turned it over, I saw it and it was stitched like crazy in there. We had to cut it with the wire cutters to get it out, but I never broke a needle or hit that pin. Okay, any other comments? We were, we were going to talk briefly about coffee because, you know, coffee is kind of my, my thing. So I've instituted something new, and this is absolutely no pressure. But there's a little website called Buy Me a Coffee. Dave's putting a link up there. And I've opened that up, and it is basically a place where you can, if you wish, support my little studio and these free lessons by buying me a coffee with the donation of, I think the minimum is $5. So if you want to, from time to time, that would be super helpful. I've typed in there, our current goal is that we want to upgrade some of our camera equipment. And it is a significant amount of money, but it would make this job a lot easier and therefore easier to do oftener. It would not necessarily have to be Dave and I all the time. He would not always have to be here, that sort of thing. And also it would help particularly our overhead view. Um, we could provide better focus and clarity on the quilting because currently we're just doing all of this with our smartphones. Anyway, if you want to, buymeacoffee.com. That would really help us and it will go toward cameras for doing 
more and better quality of these episodes. So thanks so much for watching today. I have appreciated you all being here. And as always, this will be replayable as often and whenever you like on the Facebook page and give us 24 hours or so and it will be up on my YouTube channel as well. So until next time, happy quilting. <laughs>